Well, good morning, church, and happy Mother's Day. It's a a pleasure to, again, bring God's Word to you this morning. If you're visiting with us, my name is Kelton. I'm one of the pastors here at Stafford Baptist Church. Uh, I encourage you uh, to visit our website uh, to get to know more about our church. And while you're there, just to to fill out an an online connection card. You'll you'll find the connection tab right at the top of our, our homepage. For the, for the members of this church, I'd like to start this morning with an, an update and request for prayer. This Thursday, May 14th, uh, the elders will be meeting uh, to, among other things, deliberate our plans for a rolling reopening of the public services of this church. Based on our, our state and, and federal leadership, we plan on uh, devising a, a multi-phase plan to gradually resume in-person services here. When, when that is, we don't know yet, uh, and at what scale, but we do need to make plans now to be ready for that time when it comes. So please pray for your pastors as we gather this Thursday night, that we would have wisdom and unity in our deliberations, and continue to pray for our, our local and national leadership as they discern how to, to lead in this time. In the meantime, brothers and sisters, let's endure in in patient trust of God and and love toward one another, just as I have seen you doing, do so more and more. Well, today we continue our study in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Please turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, where we're going to be in verses 33 through 37. But before we read, please pray with me once more. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are a God unchanging, ever faithful. You have ransomed us through Christ for your glory's sake. And so we we pray now that, that as we come to your word, that you would again act for your glory's sake. To help us by your spirit to be conformed to the image of Christ. And to help us by your spirit to use our words to speak the truth in love. It's in Christ's name that we pray this. Amen. Well, the the Glomar response is something that you probably haven't heard of, uh, but you know it. It's a, a phrase coined by the CIA when asked for some information to to give a response that will neither confirm nor deny. For example, we can neither confirm nor deny that our agency has any records matching your request. The phrase originated with a a CIA project to recover a, a sunken Soviet nuclear submarine and whatever secrets it might hold during the height of the Cold War. When a journalist asked the CIA to disclose information about the project and whether the CIA had had sought to to, uh, censor this story, the CIA responded that they would neither confirm nor deny the project's existence or their attempt to censor the, the reports. The CIA was in a tough spot. Because of the, the Freedom of Information Act, the public had a right, a legal right, to know But because of oaths that the CIA had taken, they could not divulge secrets that would threaten national security. So they had to say something without saying anything at all. We can neither confirm nor deny. Well now, years later, the the phrase is used everywhere by politicians, by corporations, in jest among friends. It's a carefully constructed phrase designed to say something while revealing nothing at all. Words without meaning. Well, unless you work in espionage, I imagine you don't use the phrase much in your day-to-day life. But how often could our words mean the same thing? Nice sounding, but empty of any real commitment. Designed to make things appear one way when they're really different. Maybe we aren't lying outright, but shading the truth in our favor or conveying commitment no matter what's in our heart. Well, this morning in our passage we're about to read, 
Jesus is calling us to an unembellished honesty with our words. That's the main idea of our passage this morning. That Jesus calls us to state the simple truth, not make evasive vows. He calls us to state the simple truth, not make evasive vows. Well, consider with me as as we read how Jesus calls us to use our words. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. The word of the Lord. Well, Jesus is continuing his sermon with his fourth example of how the law is fulfilled and transformed by him in his kingdom. He is showing us what the the greater righteousness, the righteousness that is greater than the the rule-keeping scribes and and Pharisees, what it looks like for citizens in, in his kingdom. This righteousness is is born of the heart, where the Spirit writes the law on our hearts. In in the new covenant, we receive a new heart, a a new will that loves to learn from Jesus and and follow him as king. And like Jesus, his disciples will always be faithful to their word. We're going to study this passage in two points. First, do not make evasive vows in verses 33 through 36. And second, state the simple truth in verse 37. First, do not make evasive vows. As we've seen now three times before, Jesus begins this new topic by referencing what they've heard, what has been said to those of old. And here Jesus doesn't quote a a specific line of the Mosaic law, but summarizes an idea found in, in a number of passages. Maybe the most clear is Leviticus 19, verse 12. In the latter half of Leviticus, there are a number of various laws, with chapter 19 dealing with how we're to care for our neighbor. It's where we get that famous phrase, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verses 11 and 12 of Leviticus 19 read this. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You can see that's, that's roughly the first half of what Jesus summarizes in verse 33. You shall not swear falsely. The second half of Jesus' statement comes from maybe Numbers chapter 30 verse 2. All of Numbers chapter 30 is about vows, but verse 2 says... If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Or as Jesus summarizes it, you shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. In in general, oaths in the Old Testament had in the the Old Testament had in view were voluntary, but once entered in were, were binding. And you see Numbers 30 reference both oaths and vows. They were were slightly different. An oath would invoke God to undergird a statement of truth, much how we use oaths in in our courtrooms today. Vows were were solemn promises to God of of a future action, uh, that it would be performed. And while Jesus doesn't quote the the Ten Commandments here, I, I think that Both the third and the ninth commandment are in the background of what Jesus is speaking about. The the third commandment prohibited the taking of the name, the the Lord's name in in vain. That word vain means means empty or as nothing. Most people understand this to mean not using his name glibly. We should use his name with, with reverence and respect, not like a curse word. It's why some Christians choose not to even use the phrases geez or or gosh 
because they're shorthand for God's name. But the, the third commandment also means not taking the Lord's name in vain in the way Leviticus 19 describes. If you swear by his name falsely, you profane the name of the Lord your God. It would be to invoke God's name in a promise, to use God as a witness to your promise, but then to break your promise and, and do something else. When you do that, you are emptying God's name of its meaning and weight. You're using it in, in vain. To, to swear falsely is to break the third commandment. But I think it also has, has the ninth commandment in view. The ninth commandment uh, prohibited uh, fa- bearing false witness against a neighbor. It particularly has the courtroom in mind, a witness saying false things about a neighbor, the one on trial, for whatever reason. Many paraphrase the ninth commandment as you shall not lie. But in context, it means something more particular. You shall not use false words to to damage your neighbor or to your advantage in a trial. Use your words to bless and protect a neighbor. The Old Testament prohibited lying oaths that dishonored God's name. But Jewish leaders were doing all they could to make sure that they weren't disobeying the letters of these laws. In Jesus' day, there was an entire legal system, an entire hierarchy of oaths based on the object that it was sworn on. Far more than the examples that we have here in verses 34 through 36. These practices were developed to avoid using God's name in vain, but also to avoid accountability. They could get out of those oaths without guilt because they weren't taking God's name in vain. The scribes and Pharisees were using these man-made rules to avoid the heart of the matter, honoring God and being reliable. In light of this, Jesus forbids oaths. He says, do not take an oath at all. I understand the, the at all of verse 34 to be qualified by the explanation and examples that follow. The all means All kinds of evasive vows, like the ones he describes. Some Christians, though, are are convinced otherwise. The the Amish, uh, Mennonite, Quakers take no oaths at all, even in court. I read the most curious headline while studying this week. Amish in haircutting case don't want to swear oath. Apparently, a group of Amish had gone and cut the beards and hair of a rival group, for, which for them is an incredibly degrading act. But in court, the defendants refused to take an oath. An op-ed in this, this newspaper pointed out what the artic- article didn't clarify, that their refusal to take an oath wasn't per- peculiar to, to this case, but based on James chapter 5, verse 12, and in our verses here in, in Matthew, the Amish never take oaths at all and are protected by the law to, to do so. And the op-ed offered their reasoning. Taking oaths to tell the truth implies a double standard, that it is somehow more important to tell the truth in court than at other times. And, of course, the op-ed is right. It is always equally important to tell the truth. But I I disagree with Elmish. I don't think Jesus here is prohibiting us from taking any oath at all, especially in submission to our governing authorities. Well, why do I say that? Well, let's, let's first start with Paul. In Acts 18, Paul shaves his head because he is under a vow, possibly a Nazarite vow. But but even more than that, he explicitly makes oaths in his letters, like in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, where he says, I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Here, he, he calls God as witness. He is making an oath. And even more than that, he, he calls others to take oaths, like in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 27. 
There he says to the Thessalonians, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. So clearly Paul thought it was okay to take oaths and encourage Christians to do so as well. Well, maybe, maybe Paul was wrong. He, he didn't understand what Jesus was teaching here. No, he was following the example of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 27, starting in, in verse 57, Jesus is before Caiaphas, the high priest, after his arrest. Despite all the false witnesses against him in this sham trial, Jesus has remained silent. That is, un until the, the high priest puts him under oath. Verse 63 reads, But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. That word adjure means to put someone under oath by the living God. So Jesus speaks up. Jesus did not sin by speaking under oath. Perhaps the greatest example is that not only did God the Son incarnate take oaths, but God himself voluntarily took an oath, according to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. There, the author to the letter of Hebrews is, is speaking of the promise, God's promise to Abraham. Hebrews said that God wanted to make his promise to Abraham even more sure by making an oath. God had already make, made numerous promises to, to Abraham, but in Genesis chapter 22, God makes an oath. After Abraham offers up Isaac in obedience to God, God says, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. God had, had no one greater to swear by, so he swears by himself. In the words of Hebrews, So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his promise, he guaranteed it with an oath. Of course, God had not lied or deceived in his earlier promises, but he wanted to add even greater certainty, so he added an oath. Paul, Jesus, and, and God himself take oaths. God used his oath to give Abraham and, and us assurance of his good purposes to bless the heirs of his promises. Jesus' teaching on evasive oaths prompts us to consider trustworthy oaths, and none better than God's oath. Stafford Baptist Church, I wonder, do you ever doubt God's goodness to you? Do you ever wonder if, if the gospel is true? Or if you're really going to be saved in the end? God knows that we are prone to doubt. Like he did for Thomas, who demanded to see Jesus' hands and inside before he would believe. God desires to, to show us his unchanging purpose so that we would have strong encouragement to hold fast. God goes above and beyond what is necessary to give us assurance. He didn't have to make any oath to Abraham. God cannot lie. His, his earlier promises should have been sufficient. He took this oath not because the promise was threatened. He took the oath because our assurance was weak. Brothers and sisters, you have, have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before you. Everything God has ever promised has come to pass. He has never shaded the truth of his promise or changed his mind when he found out new information or accidentally miscalculated his plans. We humans, our plans fail, even without sin in the picture. But God's purposes never fail. God, whose, whose heart is, is gentle to the doubting and anxious, guarantees his promise with an oath. Because of that, you can have lasting comfort if you take refuge in Christ. 
He isn't going to add an, an entrance exam when you get to heaven that you weren't warned of beforehand. No, the, the promise stands eternally and unchanging. What must you to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. In faithfulness to all that God had promised, he sent Jesus Christ as the sacrificial lamb to, to bear the penalty that our sins deserved so that you can be justified by faith, made right with God, not by your works, but by faith because of his mercy. Christian, you, you stand before God, holy and loved because God is unswervingly committed Dedicated to his own glory in saving sinners from his own wrath. But God's unswerving dedication to his own glory should be equally unsettling if you don't take refuge in Christ. If you're joining us today and, and you're not a Christian, thank you so much for joining with us. There's no better way for you to spend your, your time in quarantine than, than sitting under God's word and hearing from him. Because of, of God's unchanging purpose, as certain as we can be that, that we will be saved, we can also be certain that those who, who refuse to repent and believe, who, take, who do not take refuge in Christ, will not be saved. God has, has made it clear, and he will not change his mind. The only rescue from sin's penalty comes by faith in Christ. Find God's refuge in Christ. Believe today and be saved. What comfort there is, what certainty in God's promise made sure by an oath. What, what God, what Jesus is forbidding in these verses is not oaths like, like those, but, but the evasive vows of the scribes and the Pharisees. You see, in, instead of taking oaths in, in God's name, like God does in Genesis 22, or Jesus does before Caiaphas, they were taking oaths in, in secondary things. Jesus gives us examples of those in, in, chapter, or in verses 34 through 36. For example, they would take oaths by heaven. I swear to heaven. It's not God, the reasoning goes, but still sacred. Uh, in, in an innocuous substitute. Jesus corrects their thinking in the, the second half of, of verse 34. Heaven is the throne of God. This language comes from Isaiah chapter six, 66, verse 1. Heaven is inseparably linked with God. It was his dwelling place and, and possession. Heaven is, is sacred because it is, it's God's throne room. Or earth, in verse 35. Earth is his footstool. A footstool was a part of a throne, the king's throne, where his feet rested. Heaven, God's throne, cannot contain him. God also dwells on earth, his footstool. They would also take oaths by Jerusalem, which is called here the, the city of the great king. While Jerusalem is the city of, of David, the great king, this language comes from Psalm 48, verse 2, where the great king of Jerusalem is identified as God. Jerusalem, too, is inextricably linked with God. Heaven, earth, Jerusalem, they do not exclude God. He switches a bit in verse 36, prohibiting oaths by your head. The idea is, may I lose my head if what I say is not true or if I fail to fulfill my promise. But Jesus says, you have no power over your head. You cannot change the color of your hair. Dying it just masks it. Even your hairs are under God's control and ownership. No, everything in all of creation and all that you are is God's. You can try to make an oath without using God's name, but everything is tied to him. And the, the Pharisees believed that they could break these oaths sworn by these sacred objects with, without guilt, since they hadn't explicitly mentioned God's name. 
But the truth is you, you can't keep God out of any trans- transaction, out of any promise. They were acting like, like heaven, like earth, like Jerusalem, and their heads are nothing. But they are all gods. And by acting like that they are nothing, they are treating the Lord in vain. To, to put it positively, whoever swears on heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Whoever swears on your head swears on the God who controls and owns your head. The scribes and Pharisees were following the letter of the law, but by swearing falsely in his name were being faithless to its spirit. The image I have is is like parents with their young children on a long drive. The kids in the back seat are annoying and poking one another, so the parents say, stop touching one another. Well, of of course, one child puts his finger as close as possible to his sibling and taunts without touching them. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. It's a silly and and obvious case of of missing the point. No, friends, the, the greater righteousness of Christ's kingdom is not simply avoiding using the wrong sacred objects in oaths in order to obey the letter of God's law. It's recognizing that that everything in creation and and you are ruled over by God. Everything we do and say and and think is before God. And as his image bears, we either honor his name or empty his name of, of its meaning. Brothers and sisters, do you live life before the face of God? Everything we do, whether we realize it or not, is is done in his presence. He is everywhere. Jesus Jesus instructs us, do not take, do not make evasive vows. You cannot avoid God. And especially as as a Christian, you bear his name in in everything. You are Christ in, Christian, named after Christ. Everything you do reflects on Christ. Christ. Do not take his name in vain. Jesus instead, in verse 37, calls us to to state the simple truth. Let's read again verse 37 and move to our second point. State the simple truth. Jesus says, Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Well, Jesus' instructions are incredibly simple. His his yoke is not burdensome. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus is here showing us that that oaths shouldn't be necessary. Christians should be known for their integrity of speech and reliability. They say what they mean and and mean what they say. All of our words are, are binding and should need no extra buttressing. If you need an oath to secure the truth of your words then your integrity is already compromised. Well, Stafford Baptist Church, let what you say be yes or no. We are are so often tempted to misrepresent ourselves to others day in and and day out. Lying in in some shape or form is, is so universal, it's as given as the locks on our car in our house, just a part of living in a sinful, fallen world. Sometimes we lie out of malice to to hurt others. I think even more often we lie to impress or to use people or to keep others from seeing you in in a bad light. All out of pride because of self-love. We lie to protect ourselves from being seen as we really are and to secure what's in our best interest. Part of the work that that I had to do this week was to impress on my heart just how awful this kind of of shading the truth is. Hey, you might think, I'm not bearing false witness in court. My half-truths aren't hurting anyone. Nobody knows. And you might be right. No one is really hurt. No one real, no. Except God. Lying is an offense against him. And he sees all of it better than even we do. 
Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19 says that among the things that the Lord hates are a lying tongue and a false witness who breathes out lies. God hates a lying tongue. In John 8, verse 44, Jesus says that the Jews were of their father, the devil, that he is a liar and father of lies. To lie is to be in the image of Satan, not of God our Father. James calls our tongues a fire, a world of unrighteousness that stains the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, set on fire by hell. That the tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Friends, putting a bridle on your tongue is, is not enough. It's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. We need a new heart, a changed will that is so much more in love with honoring God and making Him look great than making our own tiny selves look slightly better. How, how silly of us. I, I'm often tempted to lie about things that I've accomplished or to lie about why I haven't done things that I, I said I would, things I should have done. Why am I so often worried about what other people think of me? When I'm asked, have you done this? The right answer is no. But everything in my pride wants to say, I, I can neither confirm or deny whether or not I've done it. I don't want people to think less of me. So I try to say it in a way that, that makes me look better with an excuse or talking about something else that I have done, making my no a yes. Why would, why would I, why would we work for the glory that comes from man? God, the, the Lord of heaven and earth, the transcendent and infinite spiritual being, creator and, and judge of all holy and pure, good and true, gives us acceptance and peace by faith in Christ. Why manipulate the truth to gain acceptance by, by others? Who are men? You have the most important acceptance in the universe. You can be free to be brutally honest about yourselves before others because God has welcomed you as you truly are, broken and sinful, but forgiven in Christ. Church, use your words to make Jesus look amazing, not yourselves. Confess your, your sins and forgetfulness when prompted. We aren't sinless and infinite. Only God is. State the truth as it is, not how you wish others would think it is. Jesus is, is calling our words here to, to bless others, not ourselves. The only reason to take uh, and break evasive vows is to help yourself. They are rooted in, in pride. Instead, Paul calls us in Ephesians 4, verses 25 and, and 29, to, to use our words in a way that, that reflects we are members of one another, to build and, and give grace. There he says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. hear. Brothers and sisters, you should speak truth, because we are more than just neighbors, but members of the same body. Lies destroy fellowship. Your speech should be aimed at building up others, not building yourself up. Use words that, that give grace, that edify and, and benefit others, not flatter, slander, or deceive. Yes, sometimes these words that give grace will be hard words, but hard words are necessary sometimes, as fits the occasion, Paul says. I think Jesus in verse 37 also encourages us to be thoughtful and reliable about our commitments. Often we're tempted to make commitments because we don't want to disappoint others or want to impress others. But make sure your commitments match your heart. You are making a commitment to God first and foremost. 
If you're a member of this church, you have made a specific promise to every other member of this church and and to your pastors. We call it a a membership covenant, a, a voluntary oath that we make to one another. It's a summary of how the Bible teaches how we're supposed to live with one another in a church. As as members of Stafford Baptist Church, you have made the promise in in how to live with one another. It says that we're to speak the truth in love to one another, to remember one another in prayer, to aid one another in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and courtesy in in speech. I think these promises are are especially hard to do during this time of, of trial when we're not allowed to meet together. But that makes them all the more important. And it's how you have promised as a member of this church to live. Be faithful to your commitment. And spend some time today considering how you can be faithfully, how you can faithfully fulfill this covenant that you have made with other members of Stafford Baptist Church. Maybe call or email another member and ask how you can pray for them. Be mindful of our more vulnerable members and think how you can aid them in in sickness and distress. Well, your your commitment, your promise to Stafford is is not your only commitment. Because we are finite and not in control, sometimes what we plan will will change. Maybe you've learned new information or something that has happened that, that forces a change. We are not God. James tells us to make all plans by by saying, Lord willing. It is the Lord's will in our plans that are ultimate. So verse 37 encourages us to to let your words reflect your your thoughtful and honest desires. And trust them to the Lord. Stafford Baptist, let what you say be simply yes or no. As John Calvin summarizes it, have nothing on your tongue but what is in your heart. Anything more than this, Jesus says, comes from evil. It is sinful rebellion from God to misrepresent the truth with our words. And he will judge all evil. But praise God for being faithful to his word and fulfilling his promise to us to deliver us from evil in Jesus Christ. You know, there there was an episode in, in Paul's life where his plans failed And he was accused that that his words were yes and no at the same time. And in that moment, he points to the the faithfulness of God. He had planned to to visit the Corinthians and had told them so, but his plans changed. Were his words yes and no? Well, he, he wrote in 2 Corinthians 17 and following, Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no? At the same time, as surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaim among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ, and has anointed us, and who has also put his seal on us, and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The the failure of Paul's words, as, as honest as they were, points us to the faithfulness of God's word. In him it is always yes. All the promises of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. All that God promised for his people, guaranteed with an oath, is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He establishes us, anoints us, and seals us with his spirit. God is faithful. He has been faithful to deliver you from evil in Christ. And he calls us as his children to be like him, to state the simple truth. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and and praise for your faithfulness to all your promises to us. That you have given us encouragement to hold fast to your promises.
by guaranteeing them with, with an oath. We pray that, that our words would reflect your words, utterly true, always faithful. Help us to live always in light of your presence and, and the rule of all things. We pray that in light of the truth of your word, we would live without pretense or lies before you or anyone else. In Christ, amen.